the other input, I suppose, in some respects, into a lot of these issues is the scientific or the technical input. And uh, a person who's been very much involved in that area is our next speaker, Associate Professor Bryce Kelly. He's from the Connected Waters Initiative, School of Biological, Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of New South Wales. Professor Kelly has a BSc and a PhD and over 20 years of international lecturing, consulting and research experience in hydrogeology, environmental geology, 3D ge geological modelling, geostatistics, geophysics and petroleum ge geology. He has undertaken consulting assignments for the US Geological Survey, the US EPA, um, a whole range of different organisations, both uh, commercial such as Shell and also government, uh, including the New South Wales EPA, the Cotton Catchment Community, CRC, and the National Water Commission. Recently, for the Australian National Water Commission, he authored the crystallised scripts for analysing and visualising groundwater data throughout the catchments of the Murray-Darling Basin. He's an active participant in the Cotton Catchment Community, CRC, and represents the organisation at community and industry meetings. In 2011, he was a finalist for the Eureka Peter Cullen Prize for Water Research and Innovation and is now a Chief Investigator with the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training. So there's few better qualified to discuss some of the technical and scientific issues of the clash between uh, mining, petroleum industries and agriculture than Professor Bryce Kelly. Please welcome him. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for having me here and hopefully I can be informative and give you some information that will help you with these discussions. I've got uh, the Google Earth image which is slightly zoomed out from what you saw before. The irrigation, coal mining and coal seam gas as one of all side by side. We'll talk ab about that collision. Australia has enormous um, coal deposits. They extend from Sydney all the way through to central Queensland. And as was pointed out nicely by Fiona, they are overlying these regions, we also have some of our most fertile soils. We have the uh, Liverpool Plains and the, the Condamine as two classic examples of highly productive agricultural regions. Coal seam gas production in Queensland has grown rapidly. We now have around about 7,000 wells uh, that have been um, installed throughout uh, Queensland and there will be many thousands more to come. Billions of dollars has already been um, sort of associated with the industry and with contracts uh, to deliver the coal seam gas through to China, India and other partners. So clearly the coal seam gas sector is with us and we've got to work out um, what the impacts will be and how we're going to work with multiple sectors. New South Wales, slow to get going in terms of coal seam gas production. We've got Santos, now formerly Eastern Star, in the um, Pilligo region. Um, AGL have been operating for quite some time now down in the Camden region, southwest of Sydney. And there are additional areas of interest, including but not limited to the Hunter, Southern Highlands, Ballada, Gloucester, and um, Lismore regions. So there's a lot of exploration occurring at this point in time. So a lot of people have seen activity in terms of exploration, but it's not production. So what's the big question? It's all about the connectivity between the coal measures and the alluvial aquifers. This is where we have a lot of interest now. And that all depends on the porosity, hydraulic connectivity, the fractures, the faults and the dikes. Let's have a look at those. So here's a, a core sample which I actually uh, took as part of my work on the Sydney Ocean Outfall Tunnels. And this is my light. Here's our shale and this is the sandstone. Here's a nice picture of some mud in one of our agricultural regions and then get the nice cracking and here you can see the same cracking through the, the sand when you split that core open. So that should give you a sense that where you have the silts and clay stones in the rock formations that overlie the coal seams, you don't have highly permeable material or, or what's called hydraulic connectivity. The hydraulic connectivity is very low where you have these silts. Where you have the sand you can get, whoops sorry, where you have the sand you can get some moderate movement of water between and around the formations. Where does, most of the, where does most of the fluid move? Most of the fluid moves through 
the fracture networks and th along major geological features such as dikes and major faults. So you need to have an understanding of what the fracture density is in a region and also where the major geological faults and dikes are within your region to understand connectivity between our formations. Here's a nice big chunk of coal taken from the Hunter Valley. And in this picture, if you can see the, the rectangular pattern in here, and it's the little fractures through here, these are the cleats. And this is what all the coal seam gas production is about fracking, is trying to open up the size of those little cleats. So the hydraulic fracking involves the injection of water, some sand, and small quantities of additives into the well under extremely high pressure. The water helps to expand the fractures in the coal seams and deliver the sand and, and chemicals into those uh, cleats. The grains of sand there to prop open the uh, fractures and improve the longer term capacity of extraction of gas. You don't need to frack at all sites. Um, and some places where it's quite permeable, they'll be able to do coal seam gas production without uh, fracking. So fracking chemicals, the additives used depend on the company, local laws, and geological setting. <coughs> so most CSG companies list the fracking fluids constituents on their websites. And just a generalization here, you have uh, acids being added, salts, gelatine, and enzymes. So these additives, they help change the surface tension uh, between the gas and the coal substrate, enhance the viscosity of the fluid movement along the fractures, dissolve the minerals in the fractures, and stabilize the clay and prevent corrosion. So depressurization, when you're extracting the gas, it should pull the fracking chemicals back towards the production uh, well. And that's something which is not often emphasized. To extract the gas, as I said, the region around the well is depressurized. And this causes the water and the gas to move towards the well. The reduction in pressure propagates away from the production zone and is detected as a decline in the water level in the neighboring monitoring wells. So gas production does not dewater the coal seams or immediate surrounding rocks. Rather, the sedimentary framework is compressed and the pore volume decreases. So depressurization causes substance of the land. To show this graphically, we, here we have our, our, our very schematic coal seam gas production well. It's depressurized in this zone here and we have fluid movement towards the production well. You'll have your Great Artesian Basin boreholes, which will extend past most of the coal measures in most regions, and then we have our alluvial aquifers. In the balloon coal measure regions, one of the concerns is what will the depressurization do to the uh, water levels in the condomine alluvium? And so this is a multi-decadal impact. We're actually looking at something which will play out by around about 2060. So this has to be a long-term um, analysis. So the balloon coal measures, they underline the majority of the condomine alluvium between Romerin and Chinchilla. And current and historical data suggest that there's a probable upward hydraulic um, gradient from the balloon coal measures to the condomine alluvium. So if we go back to this image here, if you're depressurizing here, and historically we've had pressures going into here, you might actually depressurize around this region here. So one solution to that is to actually take the produced water, treat it, and re-inject it back into the alluvium. And this may maintain, or in fact, um, could potentially improve the volume of water that's within the condomine alluvium. An alternative solution is to take that treated uh, coal seam gas water and re-inject it back into one of the deeper sandstone formations. And then they've got a store of water that they can call on if they need to make good under the impact of coal seam gas production. So something I want to emphasize is that there, there's many, many types of coal and there are major differences between our coal uh, basins. And the, in the Walloon region, uh, in the Surat Basin, we have Jurassic coals. So the balloon coal measures are Jurassic, they're around about 200 to 145 million years old, and the peaks were formed in lakes surrounded by tropical forests. They're, at present time, they say they're about 14 continuous seams, but they're actually quite discontinuous. 
and many of the sandstones that overlie the coal seams are relatively, um, have relatively moderate um, hydraulic conductivity or permeability. There are a number of shales and claystone beds that overlie the formations, and they are not continuous. So the impact on an individual operation will be modest on the overlying shallow aquifers from what we understand at the present time. There is currently insufficient information to understand the relative significance of the proposed coal seam gas um, activities in portions of the recharge to the integral Great Artesian Basin units. This has been a very preliminary study looking at the cumulative impact by the University of Southern Queensland. So water production is predicted to peak at around about 200,000 megalitres per year, or 550 megalitres per day. That's about the size of a typical irrigation licence, so one per day, at around about um, 2020 through to 2025, based on the current um, production projections. The extent of the drawdown will be different for each of the geological formations, and more work is required to actually look at the, the impact on the shallow aquifers. Lastly, because we haven't actually <coughs> measured the physical parameters within many of the aquifer materials that we're looking at. So they're going to have a relatively high production rate of water in the, out of the Walloon coal measures of around about 0 0.1 through to 1 megalitre per day. This is the schematic of the stratigraphy of the region. We have our Walloon coal measures. I'm going to show us an image later on that used, talks about the Springbok sandstone, which overlies the Walloon coal measures. Here we have our condomine alluvium way up the top many geological layers in between, and where I was talking about before, about the injection of the water back into a lower sandstone unit, they're talking about the precipice sandstone, well below the balloon coal measures. So there are trigger levels that have been um, discussed, and these are in draft and under review. There is going to be this, uh, a need to make good where you, in the shallow alluvial aquifers, the water levels have dropped by more than two metres. Uh, in the hard rock units, in those geological formations that are immediately overlying the Willing Coal measures, you're looking at about a five metre drop in the water level um, within those units before uh, they have to make good. So we do not have extensive field measurements of the hydraulic connectivity, storage parameters of all the rocks that we're interested in uh, within these formations for doing the modelling. Pump tests would have to run for months or years to yield quality information on the vertical hydraulic connectivity and connectivity. So, so I, at this point, I'm actually quite sceptical of some of the um, modelling that's been done today because we don't have a, a really robust data set to do the groundwater flow modelling simulations. So the groundwater flow models also, they use what's called a representative elementary volume. They use large cell sizes in these flow simulations and they do not include the faulting, and they do not include um, fracture representation, two of the primary pathways by which things are connected. So what's the modelling today suggested? It's suggesting that we're going to have an area which goes from Roma through to Toowoomba in that spring box sandstone unit which overlies the balloon coal measures that will be affected. And in these sorts of regions between both the balloon coal measures and the spring box formations, there are going to be about 500 um, wells which are located in those geological formations that will be affected at this point in time. The Permian coal measures, these are the ones that actually extend all the way from Sydney through to uh, central Queensland. The Permian coals were formed around about 300 to 250 million years ago and are derived from cold climate peatlands, a completely different origin. These peats were subsequently buried to 2.5 kilometres uh, below the Earth's surface, and the Permian coals have a relatively low hydraulic connectivity, and the overlying rocks have a relatively low to moderate hydraulic connectivity. To date, the short-run pump tests indicate that there's no hydraulic connection between the coal units and the overlying um, shallow aquifers. Now, these are only short-run pump tests. Remember, I said you really need to do long-run pump tests. Water production is very, very low. The water production can be 0 0.0001 to 0.1 megalitre per day. So completely different uh, sort of issues with water management when you are extracting gas from the Permian coal measures. There are lots of mines um, throughout Australia and um, lots of proposed mine sites. In New South Wales and Queensland, most of the proposed mine sites are related to coal mining um, around the Permian coal measures. And also the, in Queensland, the uh, Balloon coal measures. It's 
pretty obvious what the impacts are from an open cut coal mine, so I'm not going to focus on the impacts of an open cut coal mine. I'm going to focus on now the impacts of the underground coal mines. So here's an example from uh, down here south of uh, Sydney. We have on the coast, just down here, the entrance to the coal mine, which goes back in underneath the national parks in here. Uh, about 200 to 400 metres of overburden between the, the, the uh, coal mining activities and the ground surface. Overlying all those coal uh, regions, we've got coal down here, the Permian coal, we have all these red units as clay stones. So hydraulically, you should have barriers between what's underneath and what's above. Here's one of the effects of underground coal mining. In the Waratah catchment, as a result of both subsidence and upsidence, uh, two geological processes related to, to sudden changes in the volume of material as a result of the extraction of the coal, you end up with this cracking of the riverbed. And now they're trying to put a, like a polyfiller in there to <laughs> fill that up. In these catchments, there's also an increased level of gas which has been um, observed coming out of the, the water. Now, that could be natural due to new surface processes being activated, or it could be gas from depth. We, we, it needs to be sorted out. We also find in the catchments where you've had underground coal mining, you get the um, increased iron in the water. So what's my advice in any region where mining activities are going to occur in the future, be they coal mining or coal seam gas, is have your water tested or make the companies that are coming into the region get the baseline information before things um, happen. Um, there's a lack of baseline information in Australia on water quality. I actually think the majority of effects from the coal seam gas production are going to be on the ground surface, not at, in the aquifers. And this is borne out by a study which was undertaken um, by the European Union, and they looked at all the activities which have happened through the United States over the last couple of decades, and they have found that about a, you have a surface incidence of 1% to 2% of the sites where there's um, a shale gas being produced. In Australia, we're already seeing this. We've already had spills. You've had the uh, drilling fluids and also... Um, uh, then you've got the expansion of the ports, etc. <coughs> the water that's being produced, there's big issues surrounding that, especially up in Queensland. So there's a couple of options that have been uh, in the draft policies. They, the preferred option is to have injection and all find a beneficial use. The non-preferred options are to have it uh, evaporate in dams or to dispose of um, in surface water bodies. <coughs> There's also the option to have virtual injection, where you offset your water use, uh, the water being produced and treated, and giving that away, rather than uh, some farmer then taking out the water from um, an aquifer. So what are the recorded cases where we've had any um, contamination of fracking, which are in the scientific literature? And they're actually quite few. Um, and this may be due to a lack of independent monitoring, but depressurisation should be dragging the fluids back towards the production well. There are two examples which I can be confident about from the United States. In 1987, the US EPA um, found uh, that there was a gel in a water well in West Virginia. And now there's a well-documented case, which is uh, currently under review in Pavilion in Wyoming, where there's been... Um, a clear example of uh, fracking fluids uh, contaminating water. Gas leaking from coal seam gas activities. Um, oil and gas wells can be built to very high standards, and most companies have details about their construction methods. But the industry claimed that there's only about a 1% or less of the gas is leaking uh, from these um, sites. But a recent study in the United States has indicated that it could be as high as 4% the gas is leaking out of the systems, at the whole system, not just at the wellhead. If this estimate is correct, then the greenhouse gas benefits of coal seam gas um, cannot be uh, substantiated because a lot of the documentation to date has been actually using about a half to one percent. There are definitely recorded cases where the gas has leaked and affected the, the groundwater 
um, quality. Here in the United States, in Pennsylvania, there was a survey done, and up to one kilometer away from the coal seam, uh, shale gas production, you had uh, gas levels above the health guidelines in the water. So you can see a, a scientific data set to support that. Of lesser importance in terms of the impacts, uh, the, there has been um, earthquakes. Um, there are two tiny ones here in England, uh, 2.3 and 1.5. Um, you can see that they're quite small in terms of how you would feel them. Canberra had one of around about four the other day, uh, last month. There's hardly anything said about it. I was just in Christchurch last week and had a 5.2 beneath my feet. And um, again, everybody just sort of looked at each other and went, oh, and it's no, no big, big effects. So, you, but you would feel it. In Ohio, um, there was a series of 11 earthquakes that uh, gradually increased and increased. You know, eventually, you had a, a magnitude 4 earthquake on New Year's Eve in 2011. The earthquakes occurred in a site that was being used to dispose water for the oil and gas. It wasn't the coal seam or shale gas production site. Um, but it was using a process that's similar to the fracking processes. So there are implications here that where coal seam gas production gets close to urban areas, you do want to have seismic monitoring. So here is our future, all summed up in one um, image from Google Earth. Our irrigation districts, our coal mining, and the coal seam <coughs> gas production. It will be an ongoing issue. There will be many debates. But I do think we do need to put a lot of effort into obtaining much better scientific information to support the modelling and then to inform the community of potential impacts so that we can have robust discussions about how we want to um, proceed in our society with balancing the, the various goals of different industries. So thank you very much.